call the meeting of the gavel. Do I have a gavel? I will call the meeting of the Capitola Planning Commission to order. Roll call, please. Yes, um, Commissioner Ruth. Here. Commissioner Wilk. Here. Chair Newman. Here. Commissioner Christensen and Commissioner Welch are not here. Is that okay. okay. Uh, this meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communications Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T U-verse Channel 8999 and is being recorded to be replayed on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. Meetings can also be viewed from the city's website, www.cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Kingston Rivera. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones. And if you choose to come up and speak at some point during the meeting, please sign in and give us your name also. Okay. Next is the uh, pledge. That takes us to oral communications. Do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda? Um, no additions or deletions to the agenda. We did receive extra materials. Um, one, a, an email that I sent out regarding ADUs was, is available at the back of the room for the public. And also we received an email from Catherine Parker regarding Grand Avenue Parkway. Is that also uh, available to the public? Available to the public in the back. Right. Okay, then next is a, a time for public comments. This is an opportunity for anyone in the audience to address any issue that they would like to briefly. It's not on the agenda. Is anyone? Seeing no one. Uh, any commission comments? No. And any staff comments? No comments. Okay. So that takes us to the consent calendar. The consent calendar consists of items that, if there is no objection, are dealt with in, as a group on a vote and don't require a public hearing. We have three items on the consent agenda. And uh, in this case, because there are issues with regard to each of them, uh, we'll take them one at a time. The first one is 511 Escalona. Does anyone want to pull that from the consent agenda? No, but Mr. Mayor, I do have a question. Uh, are there no minutes from the previous meeting? Oh. There are no minutes. They'll be in the next packet due to the quick turnaround. Good, good point. Well, I'm going to pull 511 Escalona. So, <laughs> so that will uh, move into the public hearing realm. The next item is 1500 Park Avenue. And that's the item where I felt like I should uh, not participate because I am affiliated with the... Uh, State Parks, which is uh, the applicant. So we don't really have a quorum yet on that. Okay, we can um, put that to the end of the agenda. I do think that Commissioner Christensen will be will here. Will be here eventually. I would like to pull that item anyway. Okay, so that will be okay. pulled also. And then the last item is the Grand Avenue Pathway Drainage Improvements. Is there anyone in the audience or any commissioners would like to have a public hearing on that item? Okay, seeing several. So our consent agenda has gone the way of uh, <laughs> the null uh, agenda. So let me ask this before we uh, move into the public hearings. Well, actually, the first, no, we don't have anything we can do on the consent agenda. I'd like to see um, how many people are here on each of the items for which we will have a public hearing. So if you intend to either participate or are very interested in hearing the Grand Avenue pathway drainage uh, item. Would you raise your hand, please? Okay, and then uh, same thing for the 3775 Capitola Road conditional use permit for a community assembly. Okay, it seems like we have people here for both of those. Uh, anyone have any preference as to which we do first with in Just commission? Just take the Grand Avenue first. Commissioner Christensen's absence. Okay, let's do Grand Avenue. We have a staff report on that, please. Yes. And 511 Escalona, where would you like that on the? Well, that's going to come after Grand Avenue. Okay.
Okay. Thank you, Chair Newman, Commissioners. Um, the City of Capitola tonight is applying for a coastal development permit for drainage improvements on Hollister Avenue near the Grand Avenue pathway in the R1 single family residential zoning district. The improvements include a new drainage inlet on the west side of Hollister Avenue. City of Cap, oh, sorry. Between, I'm gonna give you a little backstory on it here. Uh, between Saturday, November 30th, 2019 and Monday, December 2nd, 2019, approximately seven inches of rain fell in the Capitola area. At noon on December 2nd, public works staff learned that the bluff below Grand Avenue pathway between Hollister and Oakland Avenues had failed, resulting in the complete loss of a section of the pathway. Loss of the bluff through slides in this vicinity had been anticipated in 2017 when the council authorized closure of this section of the pathway due to ongoing slope failures in the area and potential impacts on the pathway. Due in part to the closure, no one was harmed when the bluff failed. However, as a result of the slide, rain runoff from Hollister Avenue and surrounding properties, which previously had flowed down the pathway westerly toward a drainage inlet near Oakland Avenue, <coughs> began falling directly onto the failed slope. On December 3rd, 2019, based on the series of events, the city's director of emergency services, which is the city manager, issued a proclamation of the existence of a local emergency. On December 4th, 2019, the city awarded an emergency contract to Anderson Pacific Engineering Construction to immediately construct and install a new drainage inlet on Hollister Avenue to divert the runoff away from the area of the slope failure. Anderson Pacific began work on December 4th and the work was completed on December 6th. So here we have a drain section showing the uh, curb inlet on the left and the drain outlet on the right. The blue line is the, the pipe from one to the other. And uh, Assistant Planner Sasanto got a hold of a drone, so we have some uh, good drone photos here for you tonight. Uh, that is the aerial of the corrugated pipe going down the bluff there in black. So here's the bluff failure area today, or as of Friday. The proposed project includes the drainage improvements completed under the emergency coastal development permit. Under our capital and municipal code, a coastal development permit is required for repair and maintenance activities requiring, quote, the presence, whether <coughs> temporary or permanent, of mechanized construction equipment or construction materials on any sand area or bluff or environmentally sensitive habitat areas defined by the Coastal Act. The proposed work is adjacent to the bluff at the end of Hollister Avenue, therefore a coastal development permit is required. Here's a uh, up close uh, view of the bluff failure. In December, the Coastal Commission provided a letter with a list of items that should be included in a follow-up coastal development permit to authorize the work that had previously, be previously been done under the emergency coastal development permit. Several conditions of approval have been added to reflect the Coastal Commission recommendations, including uh, number two, which is to the extent safely possible, applicant shall attempt to remove any non-plant materials from the top of the bluff and along the bluff, for example, asphalt, plastic, sandbags, fencing, <laughs> uh, to prevent these materials from falling onto the beach area and into the ocean. And number three, which is applicant shall submit the following information to the Coastal Commission, the level of storm the existing drainage inlets can accommodate, and a preliminary analysis of additional possible drainage improvements to prevent runoff down the bluff and any other measures that may be suitable to prevent or reduce erosion in the area. So with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve Project 20-0014 based on the conditions of approval and findings. Any questions of the staff? Questions. We should note um, Steve Jesberg, the Public Works Director, is here this evening also and very familiar with the construction that's been done. Thank you. So I have a question on the picture of the, the drain pipe. When I walked uh, down by the cliffs, I think two days ago, I didn't see the corrugated pipe. I just <laughs> saw a big white pipe. Is that, that doesn't look like what I saw. So there is the white pipe leading out to the black pipe. That might have been what you saw. I'm not sure how much of that black you can see from the cliff edge behind the fence. I would just thought maybe that corrugated pipe fell off or something. <laughs> Probably a better question for Public Works Dresser Jessberg. It was there as of Friday, so. Hmm. Oh, I just uh, I, I, I walked down the, the, the 
the cliffs uh, earlier this week and I didn't see the corrugated pipe but I did see a big white pipe that kind of just went straight down and Okay, thank you. So, if I understand this application correctly, it's the work has already been done and the uh, city is applying for a permit. So, what if we deny it? Hmm. Um, if it were denied, I'd, I'd, we'd have to work with the Coastal Commission closely and I, I'm <laughs> guessing that the improvements would have to be removed oh. but I you know th that's my w without uh, I'm looking not suggesting to, but, we're going to do but that it, but if it were denied I believe we'd have to remove the improvements so is that and it could be appealed to the council <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> this is a public hearing is there anyone in the public who would like to address this item How much time do you uh, need? Okay, that sounds good. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> my name is Mary Lynn Bernald. Uh, my husband is Gene Bernald. For approximately 20 years, he has been the president of the Geological Hazard Abatement District, fondly called the Jihad in our area. Uh, I wanted to give you somewhat of the situation as we see it and also make some comments, if I may, for going forward. Uh, very extensive report, thank you for that. Uh, current status of the drains, the end of Sacramento, there is a small drain going over the bluff. The end of Hollister, there is a small drain going over the bluff. The middle of the 300 block of Grand Avenue, a small drain going over the bluff. This was repaired perhaps 10 years ago after it put failure in that area due to a faulty drain. The drain was not improved because a smaller pipe was inserted into an older, larger drain. We told the city that this repair was inadequate at that time. At the end of Central Avenue, there is a drain located on the west side of Central, about 15 feet before Grand Avenue. All water, as we should obviously know, should not be going over the cliff, if possible, but should be diverted away to mitigate the erosion, which we see here. Small berms should be placed on El Salto to prevent water from other areas of Depot Hill to flow down the north-south streets. Livermore, Sacramento, Hollister, Oakland, Sacton, and Central. This was all brought to the attention of the city in the past. Response was that if they did this, then they would have to improve drainage on Monterey to handle the excess water, and they would not do this. In 2002, the Jihad authored, authorized a study of the drainage on Depot Hill, and our consultants discussed this matter with both the city and the California Coastal Commission. The resultant plan was to bore an underground hole from Livermore to Central, connecting all the present home and street drains into it, and have only one drain at Central, which would divert water over the, over the bluff. The Coastal Commission would only permit one such drain on Depot Hill. Due to the cost and reluctance of the city and various members of the Jihad, this plan was never implemented. That one drain would Moreover, when we built our house and we moved it back 15 feet in anticipation, we bought this pipe wide open. We were told by the city that we had to divert the water southward to Grand Avenue and onto the walkway if we wanted our construction permit. So what are we to do now? What is the city going to do about the bluff, the descent? 
December Grand Avenue failure is a result of the city's inattention to the drainage problem all these years. In 1994, when our family purchased our home, a beautiful public view shed existed, a walkway where so many enjoy an uncomparable bay experience. Now Grand Avenue homeowners are at risk of losing their very home. Please give this issue the serious consideration it deserves. As long as water is diverted over the cliff, that drainage will continue to contribute to even more damage on the Hill. Thank you. Thank you. And don't forget to sign in, please. Pardon me? Don't forget to sign in. Right. Anyone else? Your name, please. Uh, John Hart. Okay. Can you hand it to Chloe? Huh? Can I ask you to wrap it up, Mr. Hart? Okay, fine. So interestingly, that, um, so that's 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 just the point I, I want to make. Is that this is unique? This is the top to bottom. 
It can be fixed, by the way. We have a huge ledge out there that we could fix it. Thank you. I'll sign that. Anyone else uh, in the public care to address this item? So we have a specific application before us today, and then we have some members of the public who have raised some broader issues regarding uh, drainage and the cliff. Um, Mr. Jesper, do you have anything you want to say to that about what's going on or could go on? Or no, I mean, I can see to this public house that it might bring this up to court. It became apparent that we need to be represented in the emergency project. I will um, state that we, when, uh, I'll say three years ago, maybe two years ago, when we ended up closing the pass because of the failure caused by undertaking. <coughs> the geologist at that time did say the top slope was going to fall back, um, unrelated to any um, further failure of the bluff below. So while well, the previous speaker said it wasn't going to ever happen for 20 years, uh, the geologist said this pathway is going to be further damaged within the next five years. And he was correct. Um, I think it was a function that we had a very stop, steep part for the top of sand that was going to find its um, natural angle proposed at some point. Um, was it exasperated by the amount of water going through there? Probably. Um, but um, there's no way that pathway uh, was going to be there for another 20 years. Um, at this point, you know, I know the email that the, that the commission received talked about a plan that was done in, I guess, 2007. <coughs> we went back and looked at it. And that involves installing a storm drain system in all of Depot Hill to capture the water before it gets to the cliff, putting pipes at the end of each of these roads running back toward El Salto, putting pipes in El Salto, running all the way back to Monterey, and then placing the, the drain line, not all of Monterey, just the flat part of Monterey. In 2007, that was an $800,000 project. It's probably a million and a half, two million dollars. You know, I, I think we discussed options on how to fund that, including assessment logistics and whatnot, and, and, and I take it that's not on your capital improvement list that goes to I the think council? I have a, a general depot hill drainage improvement on there, but that specific project, um, I, I'd have to look to see if that's on there. So those are my comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So I'd be curious, to, has this subject been in front of the city council recently? The overall. No, I'm, I'm I'm talking about the, the general, the yeah. gen, more general concern about the. So, gen um, following the closure a couple of years ago, there was an ad hoc committee um, that was put together, and they studied ways to uh, arrest the erosion. Um, it's interesting, no mention of the drainage issues was brought up at that point, but um, that report was probably given to the council a year, year and a half ago. And that's why the last time. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have closed the public portion, be, but because really, I mean, this is a good discussion in the sense that we've, we've uh, reached way beyond the application we have in front of us here, and we're going to bring it back to the Commission to discuss the application. And then the broader issues that people are thinking about are, have to go, there's, that's something that needs to be taken to the City Council and see if they want to set up task force or commit money or whatever they want to do, but that's the Planning Commission just deals with applications that come before the Planning Commission, so. Okay, please, I'll, I'll reopen, but I, I'm, I'm loath to do this, but I will reopen the public hearing. This means everybody has to, it has to be reopened for everybody. It has to be reopened for everybody. We'll reopen the public hearing. Please come up.
so what I just was trying to say is that the bigger picture of how to uh, address the cliff problem and the drainage problem in Depot Hill on a, on a uh, comprehensive scale is something that has to go to the City Council. It can't be part of this application, which is to approve a particular work that was already done on an emergency permit. I understand that. It's just not something that we can address in the context of the application before us. So, so let, me, let me pull that thread a little bit. Okay. So my understanding is that we're basically representing the Coastal Commission or being their voice in terms of this because the City of Capitol is applying to us. Well, we do that all the time with local coastal permits. So, so as members of the Coastal Commission, you already talked about, you know, what, what would happen if we refused or denied this and uh, uh, I'm just wondering if there's that would get it to the council <laughs> uh, exactly exactly so if there's a, there is a concern that we want we want to get this to the council we want to force them to address this um. there is that's a method for doing that so the, the public However, I'm loath so to do that because yeah. that, I think that exceeds our authority. I, I think that's a little bit kind of uh, cattywampus. I think yeah. a, there's a better way to get things. Be we have a, a many, many term councilman here who's uh, familiar with how these things happen. But d just sign in, please. Thank okay, you. thank you. All right, any more comments on the application itself? We have another member of the public? One member of the public. Okay. CIP, I think, means Capital Improvement Projects. Right. Okay. We'll again close the public hearing. And commissioners, any uh, comments on the application? Yeah, I have some. Okay. I, uh, just a long time history on this. Back in, uh, on, a, on a couple points. Back in the early 80s, a builder named Joe Salamita built the condo project that's on the bluff at the corner of Opa Cliffs Drive and Portola. At that time, Gary Griggs did a study that would allow that to be built. And he talked about what was called the sluice box effect, that the cliff didn't slough off from the bottom, that the groundwater collected in the soil on the top and the cliff sloughed off from the top. That was a study done in, I think, the mid-'80s that Gary Griggs did. Now to go on, in the early, I think it was in the early 90s, perhaps late 80s, but I believe it's the early 90s, there was an attempt to form an assessment, special assessment district along Grand Avenue to provide drainage improvements up there. And the city determined that was necessary because the overall expense for the city to burden itself with that, to burden itself with that, was only going to benefit a handful of property owners. So the city determined at that time the way to get that done would be a special assessment district along Grand Avenue for just those properties that face the bluff. That election was held and it failed, I think, when two property owners voted against it. And since that time, it's kind of been, been at a stalemate. So that gives a little history. And I would think that if the Grand Avenue residents went to the council, this is only my surmising now, that if they attempted to asked the city to pay for those drainage improvements, which Mr. Jesperg said would total well over a million dollars probably at this point in time. I don't think the city would be willing to shoulder that burden and apply it to the whole city since it only benefits a few property owners. Now, I could be wrong. It's a different, different era, different time. The Coastal Commission has a lot more power, but you may want to consider a special assessment district up there again to solve the drainage problems. This is my take on it. Okay. And any further comments? If not, uh, do we have a motion? So moved. Move approval. 
Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. That passes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to uh, consent agenda 1500 Park Avenue since uh, Commissioner Christensen is not uh, here. And what I'm going to do on this, this is the New Brighton State Beach application. I'm going to not recuse myself, but I'm just going to abstain from the vote. Yes. So we'll have a quorum. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. that's a consent item. Do we have a, a motion? Move uh, approval. Do we have a second? Oh, wait. Didn't we, we wanted to. Well, you wanted to. Peter wanted to pull that one. You want to pull that? I wanted to pull it. Yes. Okay. Because I have one question. This is the this is the new Bar new Brighton Beach. Maybe issue. instead of pulling it from the consent agenda, you can see if the staff can satisfy your question. I've or they haven't. They haven't. I asked them. I had <laughs> tried to get them to satisfy my question. Okay. Why don't we do Turn Capitola up. Road for okay. the people that are here? All right. Then, 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 then. we'll go back to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. We you want to do uh, 3775 Capitol Road yeah. next? Okay. So this is, uh, we're jumping around here, and I apologize for that, but this is uh, item 4A under public hearings. It's an application for a conditional use permit for a community assembly use for a commercial structure located within the CR Regional Commercial Zoning District. This project is not located in the coastal zone and does not require a coastal development permit. This is the old Takara building, I believe. And staff report. Good evening, commissioners. Chair Newman. The applicant is requesting a conditional use permit to operate a church within an existing commercial space located at 3775 Capitola Road in the Regional Commercial Zoning District. Sorry about that. The structure is one of the Capitola Mall properties, but separate from the primary mall facility <coughs> north of Capitola Road and the 38th Avenue intersection. Uh, the Point, uh, which is the applicant here, is a religious organization within Santa Cruz County and is looking to establish a presence within Capitola. Community assembly uses are defined as facilities that provide space for public or private meetings or gatherings. Such uses are permissible in the regional commercial zone with a conditional use permit. Uh, the proposed floor plan. The applicant intends to remove the fixed seating currently in place and several of the interior walls to create a larger space. The assembly area is proposed at 5,587 square feet. The kitchen area, shaded in gray to the left, <coughs> will not be used by the applicant and is not included in the parking analysis. When considering a conditional use permit application outside the coastal area in the new code, the Planning Commission must consider the following characteristics of the proposed use. A, the operating characteristics. The church proposes to operate daily from 8 a.m. through 10 p.m. services to include typical church community events with Saturday and Sunday church services, midweek Bible studies, prayer events, and family and youth events. No external activities were proposed. B, availability of services. The applicant is not proposing to enlarge the structure and adequate public services are already established at the site. C, potential impacts to the natural environment. Uh, again, there are no changes to the exterior of the building and, and there are no impacts to the natural environment. Uh, the site is developed and the structure will not be enlarged. The applicant is not proposing, yeah, so I said that already, uh, no changes to the structure. And lastly, the physical suitability of the subject site. There are no new impacts in terms of design, location, shape, size, or topography. The one change that could influence the site is the impact of parking from the community assembly land use. Typically, community assembly uses without fixed seating require one space per 40 square feet. However, the subject site shares parking with the Capitola Mall. When the mall expansion was proposed in 1986, an environmental impact report was prepared for the project. Staff reviewed the environmental impact report with respect to the parking requirements and determined that there are currently 205 surplus spaces within the shared parking area. The proposed use would only 
only requires an additional 49 spaces, which is met through that sur surplus parking on the site. With that, staff recommends the Planning Commission review and approve the conditional use permit based on conditions of approval and findings. Questions for staff? Okay, this is a public hearing. Is the applicant present? Would you like to? Uh, you don't have to, but you're welcome to address us. Okay, that's perfectly acceptable. Are any members of the public wish to address this application? Okay, bring it back. We'll close the public hearing. Bring it back to the commission. Comments? A question. Uh, are you going to apply for a sign application or propose a sign yes. at some other point? Yes. And is the name going to be The Point? No, it's going to be Convergence. Okay. I was going to say, I don't think you wanted to name it the same as the restaurant. Yeah, I knew you were going <laughs> to say that. Okay. They serve better steaks down there. <laughs> Well, I notice you still have the food prep area in your plan. <laughs> uh, I propose uh, approval. Second. Uh, with the conditions as stated. With the conditions as stated. Report. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, none. That uh, carries as flying colors. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Where are we going to jump to now? Yeah, <laughs> this is a guessing game. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do. Uh, oh, five below. Did anybody try to get a hold of uh, Courtney again recently? Phone call quick, though. So we'll I've find checked out. my emails and there's no update. Yeah, so something else, maybe she forgot. That's happened before. Um, we do have the owner of 511 Escalona here as well, so. Um, mm hmm. So let's do 511 Escalona. Uh, staff report, please. Okay. All right, so uh, you've seen this project before, uh, pretty much the same project. Uh, the applicant is proposing to expand a second story living space above an attached garage and convert a portion of the conditioned space within the garage into an internal accessory dwelling unit. Uh, the application also includes a major revocable encroachment permit for an existing uh, wall in the public right-of-way. A little history on July 18th, 2019, a design permit uh, for a second story addition, ADU and encroachment permit, sounds similar, um, was approved by the Planning Commission. On January 2nd, 2020, the applicant submitted updated plans reflecting the new allowances to ADU maximum unit size and parking requirements under the new state law governing ADUs, which we covered at the last meeting and we'll delve into more tonight. Uh, that went into effect on January 1st, 2020. The new application is proposing to expand the ADU from the one previously approved to include a portion of the garage that previously provided a covered parking space. All other aspects of the July 18th, 2019 approval remain unchanged. The applicant chose to submit a new application because the previous approval included a condition of approval requiring the applicant to record several deed restrictions related to the ADU, uh, including an owner occupancy requirement uh, and a size restriction that are no longer required under state law. Existing residence at 511 Escalona Drive is a non-conforming two-story single-family residence, which is surrounded by other one- and two-story single-family homes. The previously approved project included the conversion of 499 square feet of existing floor area inside the attached garage into an ADU, uh, shown here in red. Uh, it was limited to that because there was a maximum size at the time of 500 square feet. The current proposal includes, includes the conversion of 761 square feet uh, of existing floor area inside the garage, shown here in red. The project converts garage space that would have provided the fourth required parking space for the primary dwelling into an ADU. However, under new state law, when a garage is converted into an ADU, a local agency cannot require that those off-street spaces be replaced. Therefore, the covered parking space that is lost as a result of the project does not need to be replaced. Uh, there are two minor exterior changes. Um, there's a new window on the proposed north elevation, which is under the, uh, the suspended breezeway or suspended walkway. <coughs> and then there's a new window and door where the old garage door used to be on the east elevation. Uh, I have to point out too, the proposed ADU meets the criteria under the limited standards section of the new state law. So the application for the ADU must be approved ministerially without any discretionary review. However, due to the fact that the addition to the primary structure requires planning commission review 
uh, due to the second story addition, the details of the ADU have been included in this analysis. As I mentioned, the application also includes a major revocable encroachment permit for uh, the unpermitted improvements in the public right of way, shown here on the site plan in blue. And the encroachments include an existing stucco wall along Escalona Drive and Sacramento Avenue that was built without the required permits. So with that, staff recommends the Planning Commission approve Project 20-0002 based on the conditions of approval and findings. Questions of staff? No. Questions? Yes. So you've just uh, modified our code to um, be consistent with state code, but you've put in a new parking requirement since we're in the coastal zone. That does not affect this requirement? Not until that's adopted, uh, until you approve it, because the city council, they approve it. We send it up to HCD. They have to sign off on it, and we also need it to be certified by the Coastal Commission. So until all of that happens, we are functioning under the state law. So right now, um, this application is, is treated just under what's in Government Code 65852.2. And uh, you looked at the second story, and the windows are appropriately located, and all, all those other issues are? Yes, I have those slides hidden in here if you wanted to go back to it, but we, as we discussed back in July, um, those windows were raised up to the point where they could still provide egress but could not be used as, as a door. Um, and uh, at the time, we also discussed that the uh, flat roof going out on the front, um, which looks like a deck, um, will be allowed to be a deck under our new <coughs> code whenever that gets certified by the Coastal Commission. So um, it was permitted to go into place with the parapet wall and the high windows. Thank you. I had a couple of questions, which is why I removed it. One was, I'm, I know we're going to get into this when we get back to the uh, new code, but this is kind of the first application of it. I, I guess I'm dense. I can't, I'm having trouble following the parking situation here. So before this project started, there were three spaces? Um, before the project started, technically there were only two uh, because of the lack of length. Let me go back to the... So be, if you look behind the garage here, uh, there wasn't space for any uncovered parking. Uh, th they added those spaces on the right as part of this project. Um, so really, prior to this, there were only two spaces, and they were both in the garage. So the plans say existing, no change, three spaces, two of which are covered. That's on the proposed? That's it. That says existing, no change. And then it says required, three spaces, one of which must be covered. So... Okay, when, when we get to the public hearing, yeah, I, I do need help on that and what's going on with the parking here. Then the second thing is the, uh, the wall in the uh, public right-of-way. As a result of the hearing last time on Prospect, I studied this a little bit further. And I, uh, Chapter 12.56 of our code is not part of our zoning code. It's, it's uh, standalone, so it's not being changed or anything. And it appears maybe Commissioner Ruth remembers this, in 1997, this uh, rather comprehensive... I was gone. Okay, you, <laughs> he will not remember it. In 1997, it looks like the City Council decided to adopt a uh, code um, group of provisions here to allow these kinds of encroachments when there's no real harm to the public and there's benefit to the applicant, such as in this case, you might argue. But this one was built in 1997, if I read the staff report, without permits. So I wondered, number one, did it trigger the ordinance? Because they're both 1997. And two, did it ever get legalized? Are we legalizing it? We're le how come we didn't legalize it last time we passed this? Well, you did. Uh, I'll yeah, so the last time this was included in the application and it was legalized. So it was an um, existing, it was a not it was not legal at that point. It had never gotten an encroachment permit. So as part of the previous review, um, the Planning Commission did approve this as part of their review. So it's already done deal. Well, it, it, it was approved, but when you, um, when this application by bringing the application back in and amending it to get rid of the deed restrictions that were tied to the ADU and take advantage of the new state law, opens everything it, back up. it opened it back up because it, it pretty much the, the previous application, once if this is approved, is then null and void. 
So could they because he could they pull the encroachment a bit and do that separately at another time if they chose? They, I mean, if it were denied, they could come back and amend it and do it separately. No, if it were, if they requested that it not be part of this particular application and <coughs> they make a separate application for it. They could, but we actually pushed them to bring it forward to make it legal during this application. Yeah, review. I mean, so I'm, I'm sort of having to rethink the position I took at the last hearing that we shouldn't be converting pro uh, public property to private use for just a few individuals because uh, the city council has basically said that's what they want to do. Um, so I'm going to, I'm willing to go along with that um, at this point. I had something else, but it just slipped my mind about uh, the uh, encroachment permit there. Oh, I know. I didn't see. I probably missed it. Do we have a condition about? Do we have a condition about uh, having to pay to take down the encroachment if the city decides it wants to use? Yeah, that's in there. That's in there. Yes. Conditions. Yep. Okay. It's part of the agreement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. All right. Public hearing. Oh. Oh. Would you like an answer on the parking? Yes. Uh, I believe under the previous application, um, we were allowed to count the ADU towards the parking requirement, um, but under the state law now, we cannot count that towards the parking requirement. So at 761 square feet, that took it down to the next category. So it's just one covered, two uncovered. Did we, well, she's going to tell me. Did we lose any parking spaces? I, let's uh, open the public hearing and I'll let the applicant seems very anxious to address this issue. Okay, come for come. Well, we we like to hear from you. <laughs> the TV audience wants to see. <laughs> yeah. Because mm -hmm. you have three, and that's all that's required is three. Okay. I guess I can understand that. But even if you needed four, they wouldn't have to replace that fourth one. So that's the state law currently in effect, is that they do not have to replace. So if you, if you convert a parking space that is a garage to an ADU, you have one less parking space and one greater living space, and that's good. <laughs> yes. According to the state, yes. <laughs> all right. Anything else you'd like to tell us? I have, a, I have a quick question. The the photograph of the of the home, which showed the front yard with the weeds this tall, is that a recent photograph? No, that's a very no. old photograph. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Not, nothing in my time. Okay. But uh, we're we're I think trying to do our house up now too. So we can that doesn't look like your house now either. No. no. It doesn't. no. <laughs> I've actually, I've never took my house down to uh, plywood and had it look so much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that house was had a lot of problems up there yeah, we for a lot of years. <laughs> okay, thank you. thank you. Anyone else in the public want to address this? If not, I'll close the public hearing. Commissioners? No comments. Okay, we got a very taciturn commission. I would move approval. Second. With all the conditions. All the, okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, you got it. All right, let's see what we bounced over here. Uh, update to zoning ordinance. Is that the last thing? No, it's Park Avenue. Park I have Avenue. question. Oh, Park Avenue, yes. My lingering question. Yeah. So my issue is on the conditions of approval. That doesn't so conditions of approval two, it talks about if active birds nests are found, work will be redirected and noise levels will not exceed ambient levels until the chicks have fledged. The city capital <coughs> can, uh, conceivably it can be in the middle of a project, and uh, and 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 then you know have have to stop their activity because of uh, because of birds. And I'm all for birds, but I'm a, I would just wonder that you include the words like endangered species nests, or I don't know. I, I guess I'm curious to know where this this requirement came from uh, w with the bird's nest. Did the, the staff respond to that? 
Sure. So in 2007, the original permit was a approved with this condition, and that's where it comes from. Um, you know, within the Tannery Gulch and the conditions that are listed as there are certain um, within the Tannery Gulch riparian corridor, the following are required. And I, I think you have some flexibility in that condition because it states snags or standing dead trees having high value as nesting sites and shall not be removed unless in imminent danger of falling. Removal shall be consistent with the application provisions of the Capitola Tree Cutting Ordinance. Any such tree removed shall require replacement. That's the only uh, condition in the ordinance regarding trees and nesting. So if you'd like, we could tailor that more towards this condition to um, I just worry about the expense associated with finding a robin's nest or something. Se seagulls. Yeah, mm -hmm. seagulls or crows. Yeah. Or you and could all change of a sudden it now, all of a sudden <laughs> construction <laughs> shut down. Seagulls don't nest in trees. No, so. oh, I don't know. I don't <laughs> so know. A wooden one might. <laughs> or you could change it to threatened or endangered. If so so I, would, I would move then that we modify the uh, conditions of approval to uh, insert the word uh, did you call it I said endangered threatened or endangered threatened or endangered species between the word active and nests so if active endangered or threatened species <coughs> nests are found work will be redirected okay, anybody I think uh, it's a can of worms so to speak but uh, <laughs> because I mean these are all technical terms but I, I'm okay with it I mean we'll let somebody else figure it out I don't know that it's really a big issue. It isn't a big issue, probably, but <laughs> I just, you know, you worry about. I, I think it's a good point. Little things can catch you every <laughs> once in a while, and you're. I'm stuck. supposed to be recused anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'd move approval. As is? Uh, with your amendment. Second? Second, yes. Okay, roll, roll call, please. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Commissioner Wilk? Aye. Chair Newman. Abstain. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we have gotten to a. Uh, we did that one. The There's only one left. There's only one left. Update to zoning ordinance. We've been trying to avoid it, but <laughs> we have to do it. <laughs> so we have tonight with us Eric Phillips um, from our <coughs> attorney's office. And Eric. One of the first trainings I was on, Eric was leading for the American Planning Association with oh. this uh, subject matter. So we're in good hands, and any questions you have, also, Matt is extremely all the latest well and greatest as well. Info. So. Good. All right, thank you, Director Hurley. I'll let you get seated here before I start. <coughs> Okay, so there are three proposed zoning code amendments within the current review. The first amendment proposes updates to chapter 17.74, regulating accessory dwelling units or ADUs, to bring it into compliance with new state laws. The second amendment is to remove the floor area ratio incentive for ADUs from the single family R1 zone. The third amendment proposes updates to chapter 17.80, regulating signs, and incorporates non commercial allowances based on recent court rulings. So a little bit of background. We're gonna start with the zoning code amendment one, which is the new ADU ordinance. On January 16th, 2020, city staff presented the new state ADU regulations to the planning commission. At that meeting, the planning commission requested that city council provide general direction on the approach for the draft ordinance <coughs> in terms of either matching state law or making the regulations more permissive. Then on January 23rd, 2020, city council uh, received the staff report and provided direction to bring the code into compliance with state regulation and not to incorporate any regulations that are more permissive than the state. So uh, this, this is a long list from the staff report, but they're important because these are the significant, most significant changes. So the new state law identifies general requirements applicable to all ADUs, expands permitted location of ADUs to include any zoning district where single family or multifamily dwellings are allowed, requires action on administrative ADU applications within 60 days, incorporates two types of administrative review processes specific to ADU scenario, 
scenarios, including units subject to limited standards and units subject to full review standards. It allows cities to require discretionary review process only for ADUs that do not comply with specific administrative scenarios outlined by the state. On single family properties, it allows a junior ADU in conjunction with a detached ADU if specific circumstances are met. <coughs> on multifamily properties, it allows more than one ADU per parcel if specific circumstances are met. It allows conversion and replacement of existing structures with non-conforming setbacks and non-conforming building separation standards for ADUs. It modifies the development standard regulations as follows, uh, removes minimum parcel size, increases maximum unit size, reduces minimum setbacks to four feet side and rear, and increases height uh, to 16 feet for one-story detached ADUs. It also modifies the parking requirements for detached ADUs with specific characteristics. It limits review to objective standards, which are measurable and quali uh, quantitative, and architectural standards uh, rather than subjective development standards such as compatibility. It allows objective standards to minimize adverse impacts to historic properties consistent with the Secretary of the Interior's standards for the treatment of historic properties. And it removes size, attribute, and owner occupancy deed restriction requirements for ADUs except junior ADUs. However, there are several areas where the state law is silent. Uh, therefore, staff determinations and interpretations were necessary to create the draft ordinance. Uh, the first one of those is that the state law does not provide prescriptive guidance on attached or two-story ADUs. In order to create the, a process for review and approval of these types of ADUs, staff incorporated the content and intent of the new state law with the approval process under the city's previous ADU ordinance. Second, state law allows local agencies to apply objective review standards to some ADUs. Staff has included several standards in the objective design standards section, including entrance orientation, privacy impacts, second story decks and balconies, architectural details, and building additions to historic structures. These standards are not required by state law and can be modified or removed at the direction of the Planning Commission. Staff is also requesting Planning Commission guidance on several optional items. Uh, the first one is separate sale of ADUs. This is allowed under state law for certain units, such as ones built by nonprofit organizations. Uh, but staff did not include this in the draft ordinance based on the uh, feedback from city council. Draft ordinance also includes a deed restriction for all ADUs prohibiting separate sale of ADU from the primary dwelling. Uh, number two is vacation rentals. Uh, this is required for limited standards ADUs only under state law, but staff has expanded this and included a prohibition of short-term vacation rentals for all ADUs in the draft ordinance. And uh, there's also a, a deed restriction for all ADUs prohibiting short-term rentals as well. The third optional item, uh, probably the stickiest <laughs> of the bunch here, uh, is how the tr city treats parking requirements in the coastal zone. Uh, at the very end of the government code section, there's um, subsection uh, L, which specifies that the new state law shall not be construed to supersede or in any way lessen, alter, or lessen the effect or <coughs> application of the California Coastal Act of 1976. It has been determined that this gives the city the ability to maximize protection of coastal resources consistent with the city's local coastal program and the California Coastal Act. Staff has used this allowance to include in the draft ordinance specific standards within the coastal zone uh, which deviate from the parking standards in other areas of the city. Those standards are that one on-site parking spaces, space is required for all ADUs within the coastal zone, and converted garages must provide replacement parking. However, staff has also included two additional <coughs> options for the Planning Commission to consider. So just to give you a visual, this is option one, um, uh, the whole coastal zone outlined in black, um, and it would require parking for all ADUs within this zone. Option two would be to require parking in specific neighborhoods located in the coastal zone. Uh, this is just an example um, shown here that includes existing areas with impacted street parking that we know about, uh, as well as multifamily parcels that now have the potential to create significant parking impacts on adjacent streets. And then a third option would be to require parking for properties located within a specific distance of the coast. Um, so this example shows uh, just 1,200 feet from the coast what that would be. Do we know where the Coastal Commission is on this issue? No, I do know that the county um, has put in parking requirements for certain neighborhoods, um, such as Pleasure Point, where there's a park uh, parking issue and vacation rentals, and so um, at this point, do, 
is the the Coastal Commission hasn't issued any formal guidance <coughs> since the the 2020 laws became effective, what was adopted in 2019. Um, there were also a round of ADU changes in 2017, and the Coastal Commission issued a technical bulletin at that point <coughs> directing um, all agencies to make sure that their ADU ordinances that they were adopting were consistent with their LCPs. So by extension, I mean, they, the Coastal Commission wants you to look at and consider compliance with the LCP in connection with the local standards that you adopt. And that's that's required to comply with the Coastal Act. Okay, so this is going to perpetuate a uh, difference between coastal zone and non-coastal zone Capitola for sure. Yes. Okay. okay. In, in the, just if I may, one additional thought on that is in the future, the LCP could be amended if you wanted to harmonize the two, assuming that that was something that the city was interested in and the Coastal Commission would accept. But um, to comply with the, the LCP as it is now, one of these options is recommended. So the rationale for changing the parking would be to say that, well, the uh, public needs access to the coast, they need parking, if we fill up all the parking with a, with local residents and ADUs, that limits the parking for the public. Therefore, we need to have a parking restriction to basically open up parking for visitors. That, that's, that the, that's the notion? That's correct. So if, if we were to allow <coughs> um, all the any ADU that comes in to take place in a garage and displace the on-site parking as it is today, and then they, they're not required to replace that parking on site, there will be an impact to the streets. And many of our neighborhoods in the coastal zone are already very challenged by on-street parking currently. So I think the there's a clear nexus between if we start pushing, um, densifying and having the parking be forced onto the street, there will be impacts to coastal access. Well, there's a clear conflict between the two policies, uh, which are both seem very, uh, good policies, statewide policies, and they just are completely uh, in conflict. One says uh, don't require parking for more housing, and the other one says keep the parking available for visitors. Yeah, but only in the coast. Yeah, so yeah, only in the coast. Well, That's half our city. And I think and the, then, the Coastal well, Commission would probably prevail. <laughs> and then Matt has another, a couple more slides that introduce another problem that if we <laughs> I think the Coastal Commission's lawyers have been, had more cases. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So those were the three options, but do you want to go into the... Um, yeah, the so that's, uh, that's up next. Um, so basically just in choosing which approach you want to do, the planning commission should evaluate which option is most aligned with the LCP and the Coastal Act, uh, which was already discussed. So in considering the requirement for on-site parking, there's also an aesthetic <coughs> impact to consider. Uh, within state law, parking for ADUs is allowed within the front, side, and rear setbacks. In Capitola's neighborhoods with compact lots, such as the Jewel Box and Riverview neighborhoods, uh, new parking spaces within the front yard will be allowed and landscaping displaced. To mitigate the impacts of parking in the front yard, the draft ordinance requires parking spaces in the front yard area for ADUs to be limited to two parallel strips of pavement, no wider than two and a half feet each, that utilize permeable paving and have landscaped areas in between the strips, uh, as shown in this example here. Matt, in that kind of situation, can you have a second curb cut? I'm going to defer to it. Yeah, um, we're concerned about the second curb cut because then again you take Who away another street parking, another right? street parking <coughs> space. So um, we haven't specified in the code um, whether or not, but our, our current regulations state that um, there's a maximum width for a driveway cut and you can't have a second curb cut currently without bring it forward to Planning Commission for an exception. So I think that would still hold, but we would just have to, the impact, you know, would be wider because yeah. someone's going to have to pack, yeah. park parallel in their front yard if we don't allow a second curb cut. So the, uh, the Hollywood parking, um, you've showed it there. There's a, there's, looks like there's a setback from the house. Is that, is that something that we can like a 15 foot setback uh, is there any requirement for this would all fall within the 15 foot setback I, I mean I don't see why we could
couldn't specify a distance from the house, but. <coughs> we have to allow it within the front yard setback. Yeah, so there's there's limitations on the on the the physical constraints that the city can impose on ADUs under the state law. So again, it's it's the balancing between trying to thread the needle by being as as permissive as required by the the section of the government code about ADUs, while still respecting the mandates of the Coastal Act. So they're trying to to thread that needle here. So we don't have, we're not imposing any front yard requirements then it just, just happens to look that way on the picture. Well, I mean, we're requiring the two strips. So what you see here is what we're requiring and at, not necessarily in that placement within the yard, but in the front yard, they can have <coughs> two strips as shown here. I mean, they could be, they could be the right up way. against the vertical. house almost. Okay. But typically if we had an application like this, we would, they'd be asking for an exception to the the parking requirement because we have that maximum width standard and we've approved those in the past and required the hollywood design with the two strips but um under this new adu ordinance it's by right but you know we could never say you can't have that in the front yard and we're not going to allow an exception it's if it's placed in the front yard and they comply with everything it's an, a ministerial approval it doesn't go in front of planning commission what happens in the situation, uh, as I read this, you could basically put three units on a single family property. Mm -hmm. With a junior. Yeah, junior. with a junior. So what happens to the parking in that kind of situation? Um, I know specifically there's no parking required for juniors, yeah. so yeah. I don't think we could overrule. Yeah, that, overrule that. Well, again, with the, you have slightly, you have to, in the, if it's in the coastal zone, you have a slightly more discretion um, and need to, to take action that's consistent with the, the coastal plan. The, the, the junior, uh, actually I'll double check right now, if the junior ADU statute has the same carve out for compliance with the coastal act that the full ADU statute does. Um, so the, the ADU statute specifically says that no, none of its special provisions keep the Coastal Act from applying. I'll, we'll confirm if that's also in the JADU section, but the default is that there's no parking provided for JADUs and very limited parking for the ADUs. Um, and outside of the coastal zone, we, we have, don't have any discretion over those. So the, the only time you can really create that um, triplex is if you have a detached ADU and then a junior ADU in the home. And if you recall at our last meeting, Matt brought up a map that showed all of Capitola and the areas where we could regulate parking. And the only area that wasn't within, is it a quarter or a half mile of a bus stop? Half mile. A half mile of a bus stop was Cliffwood Heights neighborhood because a couple bus stops have been removed recently that have been operating recently. Um, so in that scenario, the only place where you could require parking would be in Cliffwood Heights because every other an internal ADU is exempt from on-site parking. Um, the, the detached is the only one we can regulate under the standards. So Even in the coastal zone? So in the, no, so in the coastal zone, we have that ability. So that's just, if, if we didn't have stricter standards for the coastal zone. Well, so, I mean, I don't mean to jump ahead here. I had, you hadn't finished and It's okay, there's just a little bit more. You want to finish and then come back, sure. and I'm going to forget what I was going to say. No, say it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I haven't really thought about it in this way in terms of coastal zone versus non-coastal zone, but the parking pressure in Capitola is uh, great everywhere, but it's especially great in the coastal zone. And I think as much as possible, we should have the Coastal uh, Act trump the new ADU Act as far as uh, exempting parking as, as much as we can do that and that, which I think is probably a lot given that that provision that says the coastal zone trumps so just one new section add none of this applies in the coastal zone <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, also, since the agenda packet went out, uh, staff received clarification on how the guaranteed allowance under the new state law is to be applied. I don't know if you remember this from the last meeting, but this is the 800 square feet, 16 feet or less, four feet setbacks have to approve. Um, 
The 800 square foot allowance is applied to both existing and proposed single family dwellings with accessory dwelling units, including projects on vacant lots with new single family dwellings and ADUs, and projects with additions to existing structures and ADUs. Uh, in order to clarify this, staff added a sentence to the section stating that the guaranteed allowance of 800 square feet of floor area is in addition to the maximum floor area of a property. I will give examples of this on the next slide, uh, but this one had a few other little changes as well. Uh, the language in subsection H of the draft ordinance was modified to impose a maximum floor area of 800 square feet and a maximum height of 16 feet. The original language that was in here uh, was from the government code section that established the lower limit of what local agencies could prohibit in terms of floor area and height, and so we just went with that lower limit as our maximum. Is there a minimum size? Uh, it can't be, you can't impose a minimum of less than 150 square feet because that's the minimum efficiency unit size, so but we don't have one in our code. Yeah. This just blows a hole in our uh, floor area ratio mm -hmm. ordinance. I mean, you don't have to rent out your ADU. So now instead of building a 1,750 square foot house, you can build a 2,550 square foot house right. on the same lot. And if you want to rent it out at some time, you can, but nobody's making you. In, you but have you the have, you have ability to, to yeah. kitchen amenities and things like that. Hot, hot plate and a, and the, a bathroom. Yeah, yeah, the requirements are pretty low. It's just yeah. a, you know bathing, uh, cooking, and sleeping. I mean that's basically. So it. we have to go back now and ratchet back all our floor area ratios. And there's a, there's other state laws that limit the ability. I mean again there's a different rules in the coastal zone, but outside of the outside of the coastal zone reductions in residential capacity are limited under SB 330. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, so here's the two examples I was referring to here, um, just to illustrate what I said in the last paragraph and if it wasn't clear. Um, example one here is the vacant 4,000 4, square foot lot, uh, the maximum floor area of 2,160 square feet, and the applicant in this case can build a 2,160 square foot primary residence and an 800 square foot ADU, that's on the left there. Uh, and then, for example, two, it's the same 4,000 square foot lot with the same maximum floor area of 2,160 square feet. Uh, this one has an existing 1,600 square foot residence. They can apply for an addition of 560 square feet to get them <coughs> up to the 2,160 and the 800, and, uh, 800 square foot new ADU as well together. So can they add an additional 800 square feet if it's a junior ADU? No, that no. needs yeah. to be internal. That has to yeah. stay within the zoning code then. That would have to be within the 2,160 okay. basically. So. These are really good questions because yep. they bring up my major point here, which is that we spent, I don't know how many years on a general plan and a new zoning code, and one of the uh, tenets of that was uh, simplicity, clarity, so the public can understand what's going on, user-friendly. This just completely blows that away. There's no way anybody can figure out what they can do without going down to and then even then you're going to get a verbal and they're going to misunderstand it and uh, mm -hmm. it's it's not your fault and maybe it's not even the people in the state's fault that this is just in the nature of the thing but it just is completely out wrong direction in terms of readability and understandability i'm a lawyer and <laughs> i only got about 15 percent of it mm -hmm. and and you know we're fielding two to three inquiries a day a lot of weeks on this and you know yeah, we've the, been telling the them staff what our time. Understa evolving understanding has been so you know the, the more it changes it, it's hard because people come back and say well you told me two weeks ago yeah. x and <laughs> you know so it kind of begs the question we this parking thing is is uh, i'm going to call it a loophole that we yeah, we yeah. found because it's the coastal commission uh gives us that opportunity and, uh, and <laughs> is there any other <laughs> opportunities to uh, throw it out <laughs> <laughs> yeah and say well uh, you know the second stories are unacceptable because of view shed or you know, I don't know has anybody looked at that uh, is anybody any other city lo finding loopholes that it's in the coastal zone I've been brainstorming it thoroughly and Matt <laughs> has too I think this is the one that there's actually a connection to when you talk about parking and the impacts to the public street Otherwise, um, we don't protect, protect, we protect public view sheds. So on a private property who has a right to develop, we really, it'd be, right. we, we've never applied the standard that way and it wouldn't be consistent. But this. Yeah. I think a coastal town like ours is not really the paradigm when the legislature moved in this direction. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier in just sort of a suburban uh, 
city somewhere. Yeah, with 5,000 square foot yeah, lots. Right. Yeah, right. 5,500 square foot. That's what we're thinking. Yeah. 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 And it works great in some areas of our own county, you know, but yeah, this yeah. little Capitola. So how do you want to go about this? Uh, this is going to go to the city council, obviously. So if you're looking for input from us and we have city attorney here can answer questions. So we determine an option, right? Well, there's still more, by the way. So oh, there's more. Yeah, <laughs> I'm cutting you we're off. still we're still in the first amendment <laughs> right now. We haven't gotten to the second, third, but they're very short. So I read those examples yeah. already. <laughs> I know we started with the most fun one. Maybe we should have started with some. Yeah, of the you others. just filled the other way. <laughs> All right. So this one's just a cleanup item. Um, staff is proposing two other changes. Here's the first one: striking and requirements from this section. Um, this change is necessary because the accessory dwelling unit is not subject to the same requirements as separate construction. It's just subject to the same review procedure. Uh, so we're cutting that out. And then this one, um, it just had the incorrect section noted, so I changed this from an H to a G to an H. So Okay. So there's no Arkansas requirements at all for ADU? No, most don't even have a public hearing if they're under the limited standards or um, full standards. Only uh, deviations and two stories. So it may be good, uh, Matt, to stop, to stop here and just to get a recommendation on this chapter before we move forward with the removal of the FAR from the R1 zone. You mean do we want to move ahead with it or what are our um, options? Well, we definitely would like some direction on the mapping and if it should apply to the whole coastal zone um, or the, the, the parking. So if you could go back, yep. Matt. I think we should. say option one. Yeah. Is, is, uh, yeah. Narrow well, application as possible. Okay. Well, so but, but let's explore that a little bit. Why? Why did you provide three options? Why, wh I mean, what was your rationale for the other two options? I, is there a good rationale for the other two options? <laughs> so, can you go back to the uh, map? The map that we drew the boundaries. So, <coughs> wait, this one. Yeah, this one. So, from my perspective. I honestly think if you were going to draw a boundary and not include certain neighborhoods, the one neighborhood that possibly has enough on-street parking and large lots would be the Cliffwood Heights neighborhood. Um, otherwise, the area actually, I think after we, we just put this on here as an example, but without going through, but north of Capitola Road and the avenues is overwhelmed by parking. There's fourplexes up and down those streets. There's also dense PDs of multifamily. Multifamily, there's exceptions in the state law in which you can get increased density within multifamily to replace carports. There are a lot of, um, so that, that's an area that's already challenged by parking. And from Gales and the area behind it, Pine Street, they're really challenged by on-street parking. There's huge parking issues there because of multifamily that exists in that area as well. So if you were to go with an option two, our recommendation, I think, would be just, you know, maybe carve out Cliffwood Heights if you didn't want to require on-site parking because most of Cliffwood Heights has four on-site parking spaces. There are larger lots, um, so that means they have more street frontage for more parking in front, but that's the only reasonable option I see within the coastal zone that could prov that has the ability to pr provide on-street parking. So the, so let me, let me see if I understand that. So mm -hmm. in the Cliffwood Heights area, you're saying, well, that's more of a standard residential neighborhood and if we required the, uh, the additional parking then they would go ahead and do the Hollywood ribbon park <coughs> in the front yard and, it, and it, but if we didn't then they would maintain their existing yards and because there's available street parking so in terms of beautification of Capitola perhaps that might be more advantageous because we'd be able to preserve more front yards correct yeah that's a good theory. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I hate to make it more complicated, but uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. You're carving out that one area. What about the other? Oh, isn't that uh, that other area in the coastal zone? This was the 1,200 foot coastal buffer. This is the one that Katie and I just did this morning um, as examples of what we were thinking in terms of areas we knew were impacted and multifamily and things like that. What's the other one? This is just the whole coastal zone. Yeah, so, so there's that, that uh, area on the left side at the top that in option two would... The avenues. The avenues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't you think that they have are impacted by parking significantly? I think they are. Mm -hmm. So maybe just Cliffwood High, we need option four. Yeah, maybe just Cliffwood Heights, yeah. if you'd like. 
that same theory that you uh, yeah. uh, mentioned doesn't really apply in the avenues. Okay. Wonder if it, um, Commissioner Wilkes' theory that um, having it not included would mean you'd get those ribbon front yard parking. If you didn't have it, if you had this option, then they wouldn't need to do the front yard parking. So I think what you're saying actually supports this one, not carving it out. Well, so within the coastal zone, we would require the on-site parking, so then we'd have we'd oh, end right. up with more ribbons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, gotcha, gotcha. so if we carve it out, then they would park on the street and they wouldn't have to provide on-site parking yeah. okay. in that one neighborhood. Just yeah. Sorry, I, I went no, there no, no, too. No. And then <laughs> Just Clifford yeah. Heights. Yeah. Just <laughs> Clifford Heights. And there's one area of, I don't know if it's technically Cliffwood Heights, but you'll see the yellow, it's um, high density, or it's like low density along Park Avenue, where there's quite a few duplexes, and I would suggest keeping that out of it, because um, there's, a, do, do you know, right when you take a left up Kennedy yeah. on Park, there's, if you take that first right, there's... Um, the McEwen ones? Those four plexes? Are you duplexes. To? Capitol Shores? Uh, Matt, can you point to it with your Sorry. pointer? Um, uh, unfortunately, I can't the way this no, no. screen is right Maybe Sean can point right, to before it. Before you get to Capitola Knowles, it's between the high density. So we wouldn't include, obviously, the high density apartments. Well, and yeah. then um, that little connection between. Well, oh. Really, what we're looking for is for you to, to have an option for where you go back with your pencil and you draw the residential neighborhoods that are appropriate that have fairly large lots and big you know, front yards and their standard mm -hmm. and, and not include the duplex areas and, and without carving around every individual house. But, you know, yeah. isn't that what you're yeah, kind simplicity. of Simplicity. Yeah, just the Clifford Heights neighborhoods that are not already multifamily. Is is how the, I is the long horizontal line there on the left, is that Capitola Road? Yes. Yeah. So your house uh, would be... The whole Joe Box would yeah, be included, yeah. yeah. Yeah, all the all the major neighborhoods, single family neighborhoods are yeah. Clifford Heights. So. Okay. Um, so what's what what's the rationale for the just the buffer option, whatever? Three. Oh, that was just if you wanted to pick the a certain area from the coast in which people would typically walk to you know park and walk to the beach. Would the argument there be that's an easier sell to the coastal commission? <coughs> Possibly, <laughs> but you know. He just wanted to give us a menu. Just a menu. <laughs> yeah. Two options are not as good as three. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, that's the way things work. Okay, I have a uh, minor uh, potential change to 17.74.030A1. It says, except when a design permit is specifically required, I thought we should add by this chapter. So, because when I read that, I said, where do I start hunting? Yeah. We can make that change. Okay, that's acceptable. Let me, um. And then, uh, yeah. Hey, ready for more? Not yet. I got it. You got it? Yep. 17.74.030A. To B. D. B small B. Okay. And then uh, D big D. And maybe this isn't the time to do that. You might want to look at. It. I just couldn't put those two. They look like they overlap, and uh, it's very confusing to me those two okay, provisions. Let's see. So this is permitting process. Yeah. And when consistent with the standards. I get the part so about uh, postponing so it when it's a new uh, a new application, but other than that. So that was similar to the application we saw tonight. Yeah. Um, and then D, when dependent on separate construction, when a proposed attached or detached accessory dwelling unit. Maybe you could look at those because I just, uh, you know, I, I didn't spend. Uh, oh, this this is so. Um, the single family home is built and not just the ADU. It's requiring. Um, well, I can. I, I don't want to take up a, val a valuable time, everyone's time here. I can 
you want, I can address that uh, later. But I just, I'm just saying that I found it very uh, obtuse. Uh, you raise a question on this. What, what does dependent upon the construction of a new building mean? So you're under the state law, you're not allowed to build an ADU unless it's in conjunction with the single family home. Or, I, or a multifamily. Or a multifamily. So um, when it so therefore it's dependent on separate construction. It's so if it's a vacant lot and they're gonna build an ADU, this is just um, So new building refers to the ADU and not the single family home that's already there or being built? <laughs> There's a specific section in the in the state law that um, elaborates on it. So most of them are 60-day approvals, and then there's this big exception carved out for when it's paired with a new single-family dwelling, um, and that's that's what this is reflecting. And I think that then the comment is too that it it's also addressed in in lowercase b. Mm -hmm. Did they both? Uh, yeah, yeah they're that's both my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get those uh, together in some way. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think okay. My next hard. one. Is vacation rentals prohibited? So I, among the game changers that this ordinance is going to create, I think the um, vacation rentals of ADUs is, I mean, I, I've already heard of situations where people are, um, what's the name of that uh, site that you rent your? Uh, Airbnb? Yeah, Air, they're doing Airbnb on their apartments, in big apartment buildings. <laughs> they rent an apartment and then they're doing Airbnb. So, when I, I, and I mentioned this to Katie, that uh, I don't know how our enforcement is going, but uh, I um, think it might be a good idea to really get involved with this uh, site, that there's a company that really does, that does the enforcement for cities. Mm. They yeah. take, it's a private, uh, private enterprise, and they uh, follow these things through, and I think it would more than pay for itself, because I'm sure they get lots of TOT that way. Mm -hmm. They follow them all because they follow all the ads and they, yeah. So can we look into that? We can. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we can. And, and what did we do? Um, so what, what did occur there is we had hired, um, when we are, are recently to review our finances and um, tax, the, our, um, the sorry. <laughs> Um, we had hired a group that we thought was going to go beyond just looking at tax revenues and they were looking at vacation rentals and our TOT <coughs> and we thought that a component of that was actually helping us with the code enforcement but only to find out later that um, they're not they're, they're calculating that revenue they're not doing the code enforcement part of that so that's something we can revisit and um, talk with that, uh, uh, you know, we could actually put out an RFP. I am planning um, to bring on another intern into the department. In the past, we've had our interns work on our um, code enforcement, but it, it. Yeah, I mean, I just, I know you were familiar with the site and uh, for mm -hmm. the benefit of uh, those that haven't, it was very impressive to me when I, I, I read an article where there, was a, there were a lot of allusions to this site that uh, chases down people doing vacation rentals. And it seems like it could very well be a better solution than having an employee. Because we, we went after, we started this up at one point, mm -hmm. and you know, it kind of faded away. And if we hired this other company, that might not happen. Yeah, I'll take another look. What was the name of the site? It's Code. Um, you know, a strange name, but you, you'll find yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. So I've got a question about the uh, parking again, going back. We just thinking of scenarios <coughs> so in the if we have this coastal zone excluding Cliffwood Heights and they want to build an ADU and we say uh, well you have to provide on you have to provide parking and they can't would we then offer them an in lieu kind of a thing so currently our we would have to amend our in lieu policy currently we have an in lieu program that's just for large hotels and possibly a small hotel so it wouldn't be applicable but that's something we could look at in the future if the city wanted to create say a parking garage 
and allow residents to fulfill their parking requirement through paying an MLU, that's something we could consider. I'm, but I'm just anticipating an, uh, an applicant coming in and, and saying, well, I, you know, I, I'm allowed to have this ADU, and you're telling me I can't because I can't provide parking, and saying that that's not the spirit of this s state law. And so I was just wondering if we would then say, well, we've got this in lieu activity, although I, it seems to me there was something in there that said we're not allowed to have other kind of charges or that that would be frowned upon. Well, yeah, there, there's specific fee limitations uh, depending on the size of an ADU. An ADU that is 750 square feet or smaller is exempt from impact fees. Right. Um, larger ones have to be charged proportional impact fees based on their size relative to the primary dwelling unit. Um, in the in in lieu concept is is a little bit different, but as um, Director Hurley was saying, that we would want um, the city would would need to have a use for that money. If it was going to take funds in lieu of providing the parking, it would have to have a use for those funds to um, allocate that money for to address the parking issue, so that um, it wasn't just a a cash grab. Um, we, but that that is something that that the city can explore, and we can well, we can look into there's further. There's really a long his checkered history of in lieu ordinances in Capitol at least 40 years, and we've had them and not had them, and the money's gone where it's supposed to go, and it's gone where it's not supposed to go. And at this point, I mean, it, I don't think we can do it piecemeal. The, the, the city council has to decide if they really want to get into the in lieu business, mm -hmm. and then they need to do another section of our. Uh, ordinance and figure it all out. So our response then to that applicant would be, uh, if you can't provide the on-site parking, then you can't put on the ADU. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Which yeah. has been our response historically, and and even some of those people who we've uh, given that reply to have been in since January first. <laughs> well, now I can do what I want to do. They're back. Um, but if we impose this coastal zone thing, we yeah, going to be back to the previous response. So. <laughs> but they the response also includes well, you can now park your car in the front yard, <laughs> right? So if they have a front yard, they do have a solution for yeah. parking, um, unfortunately, as you know, for aesthetics. <laughs> I mean, something's got to give, you mm -hmm. know, cars in the front yard, it might be the most benign of the options mm -hmm. in a way. Anyway, um, yeah, when it's up on blocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, and oil <laughs> leaking on the street. Uh, <laughs> so on the deed restriction thing, mm -hmm. so that is one of the bizarre uh, sections of the law, in my opinion, because we have something called the subdivided lands law that says you can't sell mm. parcels until they are legal parcels. And I don't know what whoever wrote this state statute was thinking that they're planning to overturn that uh, um, law that has been uh, inviolate for 50 years, no, 70 something, so 40 some years. But I, as far as we're concerned, uh, my answer is no. You know, no separate sale, period, of uh, an ADU on a parcel that uh, somebody else owns. <laughs> yeah. and, and to clarify, I, I think this was part of the presentation as well, that that provision is, you know, it's an optional provision. It was, it was a permissive, as you said, it's an exception to the Subdivision Map Act, and it's a pretty, in some ways, it's a narrow exception. It, it has the ADU has to be built by a qualifying nonprofit organization. They have to have deed restrictions to ensure the affordability. It's um, several <laughs> several specific boxes have to be checked in order to qualify for that Map Act exemption. But you're exactly right. It's well, yeah. I said the subdivided lands law. It's the Map Act. So yeah, same the same principle that we yeah that we're working with. So okay. I guess we should get some clear direction on which approach to take. It sounded like it, there was discussion focused on maybe making an exception to Cliffwood Heights, except oh, for the multifamily in the that parking. area. For mm -hmm. the parking. So how did we land on that? I think we landed on option four, which was to exclude Cliffwood Heights. Yeah, but I think your theory has some merit yeah. to it. Yeah. Where it protects the front yard. Yeah, it, it's the one area where that applies. Okay. We need to have a motion, or is this just recommendations? That's going to be in the recommendations. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm not a great minute taker. <laughs> any, did you need any other guidance? No, but they're fine with the other things that we proposed. Is there anything we didn't cover? I know we've been jumping around. Just this is a jumping around night. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean, I believe <laughs> it, as long as you're okay with um, the staff assumptions and interpretations that I listed and the um, optional items, it sounds like you support the no separate sale. Um, and if you don't have problems with those, <coughs> then we're good. And vacation rentals. And the vacation then. rentals, yeah. which are covered. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to. It's actually related. It's the. Um, Removing the reference to the floor area ratio bonus that we currently have for lots with ADUs in Chapter 1715 and 1716. So this is the R1 single family um, section of the old code and new code as we refer to them, but the one inside and outside the coastal zone currently. Um, since we were doing away with this 60% bonus in our new Chapter 17.74, uh, we wanted to completely eliminate it so there weren't any confusing references in the single family. So this is a cleanup? Clean this is a cleanup, yes. So that's two. Um, and then in summary, just for the ADU ordinance, I already covered this earlier, but um, once you recommend, make a recommendation, it goes to city council. Um, after city council approves it, we send it to the California Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, they have <coughs> a couple of options. They can either submit written findings regarding our compliance with uh, the government code, um, or they can find that we are inconsistent with that, and then we can either amend the ordinance or um, adopt the ordinance without changes, but include findings explaining uh, how we think we do, in fact, comply. And then, as I said earlier, too, after that, um, it also needs Coastal Commission certification before it can be put into law. So then the third one is the update to the sign chapter. Um, the city attorney has recommended several changes to the regulations for signs based on court rulings uh, regarding freedom of speech and content. Uh, those changes include adding language, allowing non-commercial content wherever commercial content is allowed, adding definitions for commercial message, commercial sign, and election period, adding a section allowing small temporary non-commercial signs on residential property, and adding message neutrality, message substitution, prohibited sign content, other government installed signs and signs in the coastal zone sections to chapter 17.80. Do you want to discuss any of those? So you're going to propose, you're going to come up with some verbiage and then come back to us? It's already in there. It was attached to the staff report. Um, uh, we can. Somehow I think there's a long story behind this, <laughs> all these terms and. Uh, uh, mm -hmm cases and so forth, but I don't know if we, that's a good use of our time or not. But, I mean, we we'll just go with the uh, city attorney's recommendation who studied this. Uh, these are all mandated, right, basically? Yeah, and this is, this is an area that is, again, where discretion is highly limited because of here it's specific court cases rather than the legislature, but um, the, all the way up to the Supreme Court and the it's defined pretty clearly what is and is not in bounds at this point. Are you um, able to uh, enlighten me on the moving signs on the street corner and why that's a First Amendment protected activity? <laughs> oh, the spinners? Yeah, spinners, yeah. <laughs> they have to keep moving. If you ever see them stop, call the police. <laughs> um, I would, I'm not prepared to actually to, to get into that tonight. I'd have to, I'd have to look into it a little bit more to give you a, a coherent answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. No problem. <laughs> okay. Anything further? Are we going to go with uh, the city attorney's uh, yeah, I, yes. uh, work product here? Yeah. Okay. So that's good. All right. So that's, that's it for yeah. this item. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Uh, anything further? So we will need a motion with recommendations. Okay, so all three. I'll look for a motion to um, recommend the city council uh, enact the ordinance with the changes that we have um, recommended. I'll move that. Okay. I'll second. Okay. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Aye. Good. Thank, Thank you for creating that motion. <laughs> 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 Director's report. <coughs> Director's report. Well, what? great news was received today. Um, we did receive our SB2 grant approval. So um, I had gotten preliminary information that it was being pushed to the next <coughs> step, but we've uh, gotten the approval. So we will be moving forward with more objective standards in our code. That's one area that 
when housing um, applications come in that need to be looked at through uh, new regulations at this or laws at the state level by having stronger objective standards will have more design criteria in place um, that can be measured and reviewed so we're gonna tighten our ordinance that way just as we're just as we're finishing up the zoning code we're gonna be just com coming at it from a different angle so um, and then also pre-approved ADUs as part of that so some of the funding will be utilized to design ADUs that would actually fit within our standard lots and we're gonna be brainstorming through this so probably at the next meeting I'll be asking if there's a volunteer planning commissioner that'd like to get involved in this process we could have up to two but to start brainstorming how we're gonna approach this and um, start moving forward with a pre-approved ADU we'll probably have up to maybe four designs with the money that we received so I've seen them advertise online now <laughs> really yeah yeah so um, again uh, I, I um, lobbying in favor of trying to keep it as uh, user-friendly as possible as we keep adding complexities mm -hmm. I know that's not easy easier said than done yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay any other directors I have one quick that's one it. what's the status on now it's the tap room over here uh, it was red tagged today um, we red tagged it about a month or two ago because they were putting pavers in and the whole front yard is prepped again in violation of the CUP there was a limited area for access to the trash and so we'll be we're trying to meet with the owner and the contractor tomorrow but they're unavailable so I think we'll be meeting with them Monday but that, that's gonna be pulled out yeah. before they're able to proceed with any more work so that's okay. that doesn't seem to stop them <laughs> no this is getting expensive unbelievable to them unbelievable yeah okay Commission communications any others no. no okay then we will adjourn to our meeting in March yes okay yep. that's probably something like March 6th March 5th 5th yes you know how I knew that how I know February has 28 days <laughs> This year, right. February oh. 29. Oh, we've got a leap year. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. It's my daughter's birthday. Yeah. <laughs> I should really. Oh, no, March 5th.